أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The involvement of digital platforms, the virtual world, augmented reality, online libraries and webinars, of course, the new chalk and board of our education system, while search engines have become the new library. The internet is no longer a new phenomenon for us and Islamic leaders, educators and scholars dispense their knowledge to the masses by taking advantage of the digital re revolution. In this new age where technology has become the new pen and paper of the world, we are using improving educational methods to make things easier for students. And as we let the wave of digital innovation sweep us on almost a daily basis, Muslim Kids TV thought it essential to know how our global pioneers in education and Islamic learning are taking the baton forward. With our vision to reach out to the global community, we have with us our renowned and esteemed guest for the day, a force to reckon with Mr. Abdullah Khan, gracing us with his presence. He is the executive principal and CEO of the Australian Islamic College, offering classes from kindergarten to year 12 with more than 4,500 students. And not to forget, he also leads the chair at the Islamic Schools Association of Australia. His commitment and contribution to education is vast, and includes successfully leading four Islamic schools, achieving significant improvements in academic results, financial capacity, and integration of Islamic values across all areas of the curriculum. His dedication to assist Muslims is demonstrated by his government and private community sector involvement, which includes appointment to the Minister for Citizenship and Multicultural Interest Advisory Group, or in short, MAG, in 2018 his ongoing membership of the WA Police Muslim Advisory Group since its inception. The recipient of numerous covetous awards, Mr. Abdullah Khan holds a Bachelor of Science and Education from overseas and a Master of Education from the Murdoch University, Perth. Illustrious resume, I must say, Alhamdulillah, mashallah. How are you doing today, sir? Alhamdulillah, good, good, yes, so um it's a it's a good morning here we just uh, getting towards the end of our term three um just one more week to go and then we'll have two weeks break here alhamdulillah my name is <coughs> safa ahmed and let us commence our insightful and engaging tete -a tete which i'm pretty sure it's going to be with mr abdullah khan So to begin with, Mr. Abdullah Khan, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu has stressed on the acquisition of beneficial knowledge for all. Can you share with us the prospects and challenges of Islamic education in Australia and globally? Alhamdulillah, <clears throat> the Islamic schooling sector in Australia is growing exponentially. Uh, we have now more than 70 Islamic schools in Australia. Every school is growing up to their most of the schools are up to capacity with a long wait list. Uh, we are very fortunate. Uh, the Australian government funds uh, Islamic schools uh, like any other faith-based school. More than 80 to 85 percent of our expenditure is covered by the government funding. Uh, at the same time, they do not put any restrictions of what we teach in Islamic studies, uh, what our curriculum is, uh, and uh, the only condition is that we have to deliver quality Australian national curriculum to our students. Obviously, that is our aim as well, to prepare our students with the Islamic identity to enter into universities and workforces and be successful, proud Australian citizen Muslims. The challenges that uh, some Islamic schools are facing uh, in Australia in particular are uh, for example, dealing with the LGBTQ issues, uh, same-sex marriage issues, uh, the, uh, the traditional concept of marriage uh, in Islam. Uh, and uh, alhamdulillah, uh, up until so far, we have the liberty and freedom to teach uh, the Islamic concept of marriage to our students and the community um, uh, in, in its true essence, alhamdulillah. Uh, but the challenges which are coming up are, for example, if we have to deal with a student who declares himself uh, 
uh, otherwise with another uh, identity in terms of sex or if we have a teacher who comes up and declares himself that I am gay or lesbian and tries to promote this, uh, this has not happened so far. But the new legislation that was passed a couple of years ago in Australia uh, has put some restriction in that regard. Uh, the Australian government has in fact promised that they will bring along uh, protection of religious freedom legislation to protect faith-based schools and places of worship, uh, which is yet to come. Um, that may give us the freedom in terms of hiring and firing of staff. Uh, but in terms of student enrollment, uh, there could be some limitations in that regard. So that's one of the uh, challenges that uh, most Islamic schools potentially will face in the coming months and years uh, that we will have to deal with. Uh, so in fact, uh, uh, I would like to mention that uh, there is a global association of Islamic schools um, being established at the moment. Um, and uh, we are not only discussing these challenges and issues and how to deal with these issues uh, in Australian context, but globally uh, in most of the Western countries and even in some Muslim countries, uh, it is a challenge. So we want to share our expertise and knowledge uh, with other associations of Islamic schools in other countries. Uh, and we're having a, a first meeting uh, to plan a global conference uh, in Istanbul uh, from 3rd to uh, 9th of October, inshallah. As you know that the uh, social media and the impact of social media uh, outside schools um, and that brings some uh, implications within the school context uh, are also uh, that we're dealing with that. Um, uh, in fact, most of the schools in Australia have got a policy that uh, the students are not allowed to bring mobiles to school, uh, even in high school. Uh, but the ground reality is that every student has got a mobile in their pocket, uh, although it's turned off or it's on silent. Uh, and they are not allowed to take it out. But as soon as they leave the school premises, they have got access to a device um, and, uh, and they access social media. Uh, and, they, uh, and then we will have to deal with those issues when they come the following day at school. Um, and, and the impact that the social media leaves on them um, in terms of drugs and in terms of uh, many other challenges uh, that uh, uh, is the ground reality that uh, we are facing. Um, I mean, we, Alhamdulillah, we are much better as compared to um, uh, public sector schools or other schools, uh, but still these issues are creeping up and we have to prepare ourselves uh, to deal with those challenges and issues, inshallah. Inshallah. As usual, Australia has always been a uh, way above the others in terms of its diverse culture and it is well adept to handle any adversities that come across this way such as this one that you are mentioning alhamdulillah there was one such other roadblock that occurred globally which was the coronavirus and when this struck it forced societal changes around the globe so how would you best describe the challenges you face daily as educators and maybe as the CEO or the principal, how they help shape your vision of what success would look like for your school or even for schools all across Australia? Yeah, uh, we, we have been, in fact, for the last few years, uh, trying to improve uh, the integration of technologies in education. Uh, in terms of communicating with the students, uh, the teachers, teachers and student communication, communication with the parents. Uh, and the teachers have been getting professional development and training to uh, access technology and implement it, integrate it in their daily teaching. But it was a slow process. Um, we conducted a uh, complete uh, audit of our uh, infrastructure, infrastructure of technologies in uh, at the end, towards the end of 2019. Uh, and that was very timely uh, because nobody knew at that time that the COVID is coming up. Uh, so that uh, audit provided us an opportunity uh, to improve our infrastructure, uh, which we did towards the end of 2019 and start of 2020. So when COVID hit uh, Australia and other countries, 
the first impact of that was that the schools were closed down. Uh, and uh, we had no option but to move to online teaching. So we adopted the new um, trend of online teaching. Uh, and I'm glad to say that uh, we, uh, in fact, our staff came on board and uh, in less than a week time, they managed to get online and started delivering lessons to the students um through using the technology uh, through microsoft teams it, it was a very successful experience initially we had obviously some challenges uh, and uh, uh, to an extent that uh, where some in some of the classes the students took over the control uh, and in some classes even some of the students uh, uh, kicked the teacher out of class on teams so uh, these are the teething problems that the schools faced when we started this. But obviously, the technology has uh, uh, a lot of features available to manage and control uh, those issues. So within a week or so, uh, we managed to put those controls in place. We managed to uh, record all the lessons and uh, make them available for the students. Because we have larger siblings. Uh, we have families who have got four, five, six students. Uh, and they may not have the same number of devices available at home. Uh, and so what happens is that uh, they, th they were prioritizing that oh, older children will get first access to these devices. So their learning is more important than the others. So to uh, mitigate that uh, challenge, what we did, we started uh, uh, giving away devices uh, to the parents uh, as loan. So they can, ex they can have access to more uh, um, devices to access the learning online. Uh, that was still not enough. Uh, so because just in our school, we've got uh, more than 4,000 students. Um, so the other then solution we came up with was that the lessons will be recorded uh, and uh, the children can, those who can't access live, they are able to access after hours. But then again, the challenges of, uh, because when you're having a live lesson, it was, two-way communication. So the children were able to, uh, in fact, uh, communicate with the teachers, but with recorded lessons, then they are not able to communicate. Uh, then we came up with some other options uh, um, and introduced some other programs like Dojo in early childhood uh, education from kindergarten to year one, uh, where children are not equipped with technology, use of technology. Uh, we found that the parents were very supportive uh, and uh, especially the mothers staying home, um, uh, they were able to manage and help and support their children to access learning. So, but we were very fortunate in Australia that because of hard border policy, uh, it was not long that the schools started opening up again. Uh, because uh, the, I mean, obviously we had some challenges that people could not visit overseas or in, even in, uh, at times when there are emergencies they were not able to travel. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we were very safe in that time. We were closed for a couple of weeks initially, uh, but then because of uh, the fear of COVID-19, many of the parents decided to keep their children home, although the schools were open. So last year, we had to uh, come up with another option of hybrid teaching. And especially when the schools, uh, when the government opened borders uh, early this year, uh, that uh, as people started getting COVID, although it was not very severe, but they had to isolate. Uh, and then the close context of those cases have to isolate as well. So we had 50% of the students staying home, uh, the rest half attending in person. So we had to come up with another option to have hybrid teaching at the same time while the teachers are teaching in the classroom, they are also delivering lessons online. Uh, and that was quite challenging for staff. Uh, in, it was challenging in terms of technology as well, but more so uh, from human perspective that uh, they had to take care of the students in the class and also communicate with the students at home. Uh, who are attending online. Uh, so, but they, they, they got into it and they uh, managed to deliver it successfully uh, after some initial hiccups. But the positive thing that I would like to mention is that uh, the journey that we would have traveled in many years was traveled in days and weeks in terms of getting used to the technology uh, with the teachers, with parents and students.
rightfully said that when you're driven against the wall, you only have one option but to climb. And uh, yeah. how we have climbed globally all over the world, we can see that the schools have actually made sincere efforts to, you know, overcome the crisis in terms of educational impartation. So this is commendable. And our golden warriors, the teachers, have risen to the occasion like no other. They have just displayed immense amount of character when it comes to delivering quality education. Alhamdulillah, we are ever grateful to them for this. It is, of course, an undisputed fact that Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. And as such, we have an increasing need for qualified educators who can teach Islam to people of all backgrounds. What inspired you to become a global educator in Islam? And how do you integrate global perspectives into your curriculum? When I moved to Australia, that's about uh, in 1999. Um, I felt that uh, our Muslim youth, are they need an education that is enriched with Islamic values uh, and they are able to maintain their Islamic identity. But at the same time, uh, they are successful uh, professionals and citizens of this country uh, and they are able to cope with the challenges of the time. Uh, they, are cope they are able to integrate and interact with everyone, irrespective of whether they are Muslim, non-Muslim, or whichever background they come from. And I found that uh, uh, the Islamic schools were trying to achieve that goal, but there were some challenges which were restricting the Muslim students to go to Islamic schools uh, because of some misconceptions, some traditional views of Islamic schools, considering that they are madrasas uh, in some of the countries where they are getting religious education, but they will not be able to cope with uh, the rest of the community and they will not be successful citizens uh, if they attend Islamic schools. Um, uh, so that uh, perception of the community was in fact discouraging uh, students or the families to join Islamic schools. So I volunteered myself that uh, uh, I will enter this venture uh, and contribute uh, in whatever way it's possible to change these community perceptions about Islamic schools and on one hand. And on the other hand, uh, to make sure that we are producing quality uh, students uh, not only from Islamic perspective, but also from academic perspective. Uh, and not only we are equipping them with the knowledge, but we are preparing them to deal with all the issues that will they will confront in their uh, youth or in their adulthood. So uh, that's the reason I chose uh, to join Islamic sector, uh, Islamic schooling sector. And soon after, um, I mean, after serving for a couple of years, I got the opportunity to join another Islamic school as principal, uh, where I served for five years from uh, nine, 2005 to 2009. And uh, I contributed in whatever way possible. Uh, and then I got an opportunity to move to Doha, Qatar, uh, as a consultant to a group of Islamic schools uh, with a similar vision uh, to contribute in, in international education with Islamic vision. Uh, and that opened up many other avenues and perspectives uh, in my mind. Uh, and then I came back and uh, in 2011 uh, took over this role of executive principal and CEO of this college. So over the last 10 years, Alhamdulillah, we have managed to change the community perceptions about Islamic schools. And we have, uh, and through, uh, through results and through evidence and through uh, providing uh, good quality facilities to our children uh, in terms of building, in terms of uh, sports, in terms of uh, other areas of uh, learning that uh, were missing, the options that were not offered at Islamic school, for example, different IT options, uh, food and technology, uh, woodwork and metalwork, textile and clothing. So those options were missing and the schools were only concerned about the academics uh, and it was not a holistic approach. So we offered all of these options to the community and we produced good results at the same time. That changed the perception of community. And we went from uh, a stage where the schools were uh, anxiously looking uh, for students 
where we are at a stage where all schools are full up to the capacity with long wait lists and people are on daily basis asking us that when can their child get an opportunity to enter an Islamic school. Uh, and that is the reason that uh, we have to take drastic measures uh, in the last year or so to prepare ourselves to open new schools. So I'm glad to uh, tell you that, uh, alhamdulillah, we, we uh, bought uh, two pieces of land, um, uh, 6.3 hectares and another one, 8.7 hectares. Uh, and we already started building two new schools uh, worth $100 million, uh, which will be operational. The stage one will be operational from start of 2024. So we are hoping to finish the construction work by end of next year so we can accommodate another 2,000 students in our two new schools uh, because in the community demand is growing. And uh, it's not only in our schools. Uh, when I look at New South Wales or Victoria or Queensland, I see uh, similar growth in Islamic sector there as well. And the demand from the community is growing. So uh, the, the Muslim community feels that the right place for their children to grow and uh, uh, to have an environment, that conducive environment, uh, where they can um, be enriched with the Islamic values and ethos uh, and be prepared not only academically, but socially, emotionally, holistically, uh, to cope with the challenges of the society and to interact and deal and, uh, with, with other people from other faiths and other backgrounds uh, successfully. Uh, so that, that's, that's the challenge that we are facing at the moment of lack of schools for Muslim community. And we're working on that, inshallah, to increase the numbers. Alhamdulillah, the, the, the background behind setting up these schools, the efforts that have gone into realization of a good Islamic education, this is commendable. And the halal niya behind this is what is driving this through all the way. We are so, so happy to hear the efforts that are being done in such a positive direction. And all of us can draw inspiration from your work, alhamdulillah. The assets of these schools, that's our very students, have often said that, you know, online education is better than campus education. Uh, is it really possible to envision a 100% online Islamic school in the near future? What are your views regarding this? Online schooling, to some extent, they will get that uh, uh, sort of social interaction, but it's very, in, it's very limited in nature, uh, the interaction that they get. The interaction they will have with mostly uh, with the teachers and uh, less frequently with other students uh, and even less frequently with other age groups or other peer groups that are there in the school so that social aspect and emotional aspect will they will miss out on that um, and the academic aspect also uh, you uh, comparing face-to-face -face teaching with online teaching is not the same. At university level, that is possible and it's being trialed and it's successful in some setting it's in, and it's not in some others. But at school level, I think it is the face-to-face -face interaction with the teacher is very important. The concept of murabbi or uh, providing tarbiya to the children uh, through online avenues is limited. Uh, the, the interaction that is needed, um, and sometime one-to-one, -one, sometime in group setting, um, in a school environment, uh, and, and that's not a one teacher responsibility, it's the whole environment that will provide them that tarbiyah. Uh, that cannot be equally be provided through online avenues. From Islamic perspective, I think, and tarbiyah perspective, and social and emotional growth perspective, I don't think the online school will be the same as a uh, face-to-face school. So it will not be able to replace uh, the face-to-face, -face, the importance of face-to-face -face teaching and interaction. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I would disagree that an online schooling is an option that will replace the traditional schooling. Yes, absolutely. The best judge of all this is learned people like all of you who are handling the education system and tarbiya has to be face to face. It cannot be accommodated online, as you rightly said. Alhamdulillah, on this note, we're gonna take a short recess. We will be back and keep this engaging conversation going. Assalamu alaikum.
Unlock the love of Islam in your children and open their imagination and hearts. Muslim Kids TV brings together thousands of the best animations, videos, games, ebooks, and Islamic resources for you and your family. I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim. Let's go! I am a Muslim. Look at me. I am kind. Enjoy the best Islamic children's animations and videos exclusively on www.muslimkids.tv. I am a Muslim, look at me. I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim. Stimulate your child's learning with the largest collection of Islamic themed video games. Thousands of ebooks celebrating the Islamic history, culture, and values. Thank you, Allah, for this blessing. Unleash your child's creativity through endless hours of to do it yourself activities. Keep the Qur'an close to their hearts with our special Qur'an app. Muslim Kids TV is developed by leading educators and supervised by a community of religious scholars from around the world. Can you think of anything neater? Parties in the streets, hugging friends and so much to eat. The food's much sweeter now that Ramadan does complete it. Loved by families, educators, and especially children. Come celebrate Eid with me. With me. It's time to have a big party. We're nice clothes and eat some. Muslim Kids TV is available where you want it. And when. Enjoyed on mobile, web, and on leading smart TV brands. Your whole family can watch anytime, anywhere. Muslim Kids TV, building a better Muslim generation. Let's go! Welcome back, everybody. We are with Mr. Abdullah Khan. We are involved in an insightful conversation. So let's take this conversation ahead. Alhamdulillah. Mr. Abdullah, Australia is blessed to have a diverse culture. So how does Islamic education from an early age help promote understanding and tolerance between different cultures and religions. Of course, we have a variety of them, even in Australia or even globally. What are your future yeah. goals for promoting understanding and respecting Islam through education? In our schools, we have got, from ethnic point of view, we've got more than 58 different backgrounds. Um, so the students and the staff, and they're all quite diverse. Uh, we uh, not only prepare them, our students, uh, from um, in terms of preserving their Islamic identity, but we also uh, teach them and prepare them uh, to deal with the wider society. Uh, we also we have a program called Building Bridges program. Uh, it's an interfaith dialogue where we bring together students from uh, Christian and Jewish background. Uh, schools and the Muslim students, and they have a respectful uh, dialogue and discussion, uh, introducing each other's views and faith uh, and the values and the culture, uh, so that they have uh, respect for other people uh, while they stick to their own belief system strongly. Um, we, we, we have inter-school sports competitions so they can interact and deal with. 
We have got in the primary co-education system in our schools. Uh, in high school, it's both education. So we have boys' classes and we have girls' classes. We understand that when the students graduate from year 12, they are going entering into universities. There are no Islamic universities available in Australia. So they have to go to traditional universities to get their undergraduate degrees and higher degrees and, uh, and, and they have to enter workforce. There are not a lot of uh, opportunities available for them to work only within the Islamic environment. So they have to deal with and work and interact with everybody. So th that is very important aspect uh, that the Islamic schools have to consider uh, to prepare the students. Uh, so they live harmoniously in a multicultural society, respecting other people's belief and values while uh, maintaining their own values and sticking to it and not compromising on it uh, and, and not being apologetic about it. Um, and being proud of uh, being Muslim uh, and at the same time being an Australian. Uh, and they know that it is possible that these two identities can stay together. Uh, they don't have a conflict in their mind that if they are Muslim, they can't be Australian. And if they are Australian, then they can't be Muslim. Um, so that that's the, I mean, our youth goes through that conflict at times. So, uh, and it is our responsibility uh, as leaders, as uh, educators, as Islamic schools, that we prepare our generations to come uh, for that for for them to integrate successfully, but not dilute their religion at the same time, to stick to, to their values, but also successfully interact and integrate in the wider society and even contribute and be a productive citizens of the country that they are living in. Uh, so. Uh, they, they are not considered as uh, parasites, I would say that. It is possible, but we have to educate them, that you get the benefits and the welfare benefits from the society you're living in. Uh, at the same time, it's your responsibility to give away something in return without compromising on your values and your faith. Symbiotic relationship is key to the advancement of any society, community, and a country as such. And... We have to have only one identity, which is being a Muslim, but giving away that much that we take from them. That's very rightly said. So when we come across uh, Muslims in a society like Australia, of course, there will be the day-to-day -day struggles and there will be some curbstones that are crossed, even for leaders as yourself. So you're always making hard decisions for the betterment of the Islamic community while not letting away anything from Islam. So what is the hardest decision that you may have had to make in this regard? Okay, now I would just like to quote a couple of examples um, and the contribution that we are making to uh, make this happen that uh, our children can fit in this society successfully without compromising on their values and their religion. Um, the Western Australian police, uh, they did not have headscarf as part of their uniform. Uh, and uh, that was restrictive in terms of uh, our uh, girls entering WA police because they can't compromise on that and they, there was no provision there. So we highlighted that to WA police, as I, you mentioned in the introduction that I sit on the WA police advisory uh, group. So, and, and they were very cooperative. They came up with the design and uh, now the Western Australian police has got an approved uh, headscarf uh, that uh, the girls can wear and uh, be part of WA police. We went through, in fact, their recruitment process to see that what barriers are there uh, which are restricting our Muslim uh, youth to enter WA police. And we highlighted those areas and they have been very supportive. The police minister himself took a lot of interest into this and they uh, directed the police academy to remove those barriers uh, and make it easy for them to join in uh, WA police. Because in fact, their interest, they are quite keen to have uh, the WA police representative of the community that uh, they are serving. Um, so that's one aspect. Secondly, um, as you have mentioned in the introduction again, that I sit on the Ministerial Multicultural Advisory Council that's headed by the Minister for Multicultural Interest. So any of the government policies, any of the legislation uh, that comes on the table, 
uh, has to go through this console. And we have to look at how it will impact the multicultural communities. Um, and uh, what sort of uh, measures the different various government departments can take uh, to make it uh, easy and not to have any biases uh, uh, or any discrimination um, or disadvantages to multicultural communities in any way for uh, them getting employment or for them getting any services from the government departments. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, Western Australian government takes it quite seriously. Uh, the recommendations that comes from the council, uh, and uh, they, in fact, they have got a multicultural um, uh, framework. That and on that framework, every government department has to report back uh, that they are compliant with that, and if they are not, they have got an uh, action plan to be come to become compliant to that. So. Uh, that the Muslim community and uh, the multicultural community at, in a wider sense are able to be part of and integrate with and uh, um, provide service as well as get the services in an equitable manner without any discrimination and any biases. Um, I, I mean, I would not say that there is no discrimination, no biases uh, uh, in this society. Uh, but even if we go to a Muslim country, we will face different biases and different discriminations uh, from our own people. Uh, so it is natural there will be some biases somewhere, but uh, at policy level uh, and in practical sense, uh, there are enough steps being taken at the moment to remove those barriers and those biases and those discriminations. All I can think of now is that famous saying that uneasy lies the head on which rests the crown. And this is yeah. a hard task to do. I mean, it's unimaginable for us to make simple decisions in and around us, but these are decisions on which the base of the Islamic community rests. So hats off to all of you who are part of this um, service to um, Islam, alhamdulillah. As we come to the conclusion of this discussion, setting a model henceforth, how do you think Islamic education in Australia can be accelerated in the next five years? Uh, a few things that I would like to highlight that uh, some of the challenges that some of the Islamic schools face uh, are in Islamic sector that uh, I think one, um, Australia has got standards in everything. So they've got uh, uh, national professional standards for teachers. They've got national professional standards for school leaders. Uh, they have got standards for registration of schools. Uh, and uh, and that, that's, these are the conditions to get funding from. Uh, and they are, they are very fair. Um, so our governance model in Islamic school has to be very transparent. Uh, traditionally, um, I mean, our founders and forefathers who uh, initially established Islamic school in all, with all good intentions were based on a model that is revolves around one person. Uh, and uh, that model doesn't work in Australian context. Uh, the schools here they are funded and the condition is that they have to be run by a not-for-profit association or a company. All the profit that is generated in the school from the school finances have to be invested back into the school and no individual benefits financially from that. So, and that is only possible that if you have got a board of directors, a board of governors, um, who uh, are making decisions uh, without any biases. Uh, so we have to move away from a system which revolves around authority with one person, concentrated with one person, rather with a group of people, our board of directors, who are operating the school. That's one. Secondly, we have to learn a lot in terms of responsible uh, and compliant financial management. Uh, and that is important for the future of Islamic sector, Islamic schooling sector. If we don't, we have seen many schools uh, going into liquidation because of that. Uh, we have seen schools failing. Uh, we, have school, we have seen schools getting bad reputation in the media. Um, if we give an opportunity to the media, then we can't blame the media because they will exploit it to the limits. And we have seen many examples. Uh, 
I would just like to quote one uh, example that uh, uh, there, there, was, there was a school in South Australia in Adelaide. It used, the name used to be Islamic College of South Australia. Uh, and uh, uh, the board of governors was a big mess. The financial management was a mess. Uh, the government intervened and they started investigating. Uh, and uh, every single day, uh, the parents would stand outside the fence with play cards, uh, change the principal, change the directors, change the management. We are not happy with this. And media will come and take photos and highlight it to the extent they love to. So, and in 20, 2000, June 2017, that school went into liquidation. Uh, and the community approached us that you are running uh, a number of schools with a good model and with good reputation. Would you like to uh, operate a school on this premises and save the education of these children who are there at the moment? It was a kindergarten to year 12 school. So we put our hand up, we got the registration, we got the approvals from the government and we took over that school. Uh, and from June 2017 up until now, we've been operating that school successfully. Uh, financially from governance point of view. And the only news that came since we took over was the first news, which was uh, that uh, we took over the school and this is what our plan is. Since then, the media has not entered the school uh, because most of the time the media is not interested in the good news. They are interested when there is a conflict, there's a problem uh, and they can highlight it and sell their papers online or in physical sense. So we, we have, I mean, the same school, same students, same parents, and almost same staff. The school was a mess before 2017, and it has been running very successfully since then. So the secret is, again, a good governance model, responsible financial management, and compliance to the laws. Uh, and, and those laws are not on Islamic laws. They, these laws are meant to have a transparent system which uh, where the funds are transparent, they are being used and invested back into the school, uh, and they are not flowing anywhere else. And that's the Islamic system, basically. And if, if we have the right intentions and uh, we have the right model, both things important. Just having right intentions is not good enough. So having the right intentions and following the right model, we, there is a lot of potential for Islamic schooling sector in Australia. Um, and it, it, it will grow and it will continue to grow exponentially as it is now, as long as we stick to that. Uh, so, uh, and, and there's another uh, thing that I would like to highlight that transparency is very important. We are used to having closed door systems and not being open to external agencies. Uh, we have developed here in our schools a culture of external audits. I mean, cert there are certain audits, financial audits, you, legally you have to have it for the schools, but other audits, I'm talking about staffing audit, I'm talking about teaching learning audit, I'm talking about uh, IT audit, I'm talking about uh, internal financial audits, uh, various uh, building audits, uh, all sorts of audits that gives us the clear picture, where do we stand now? and have a clear action plan and strategic plan, uh, how to improve those things and uh, bridge the gaps that are there. Um, and if you, we are excelling, how to maintain this excellence. So that is important that we open up to external agencies to come and give us feedback and tell us that where we are going fine and where we need further improvement. Uh, and our strategic plan is not based on what we think only is good. Uh, and we are satisfied with that. But we have an external eye to look at it and provide us feedback. And based on that and based on our expertise, we build up a strategic plan and we stick to it. So if this happens, the sky is the limit. Uh, because there are no challenges in terms of financial uh, in, in Australia for Islamic schools. Because of the fund, generous funding that we get from the state government and from the uh, Commonwealth government. Uh, one more example I would like to quote is that uh, uh, if, for example, uh, we have been dealing with the banks uh, from, since uh, 2013 uh, on a no interest base, and that's quite unique, uh, living in a Western country, uh, not an Islamic bank, uh, uh, a conventional bank we're dealing with, we made an arrangement with them. 
that uh, you have got a lot of funds that are sitting in your bank from the school. Uh, and we are not interested to earn any interest on it, uh, but we don't want you to charge any fees on this. Uh, we even made an arrangement where they have provided us a facility, uh, no interest loan facility, that for certain time, certain under certain financial limits, they will provide us loan uh, with no interest because we are not, they are not, I mean, we are not uh, getting interest from them. So it is financially viable for them, although it's very non-conventional and it, it is very unusual and unique arrangement uh, that you can visualize living in a Western country, dealing with a con conventional bank and having an arrangement where you are not getting paid interest and at the same time, you are not paying interest to them. So it, these arrangements are possible as long as uh, we, we, we have the right intention and strategic direction set. Uh, and, and I have personally seen that there is a lot of blessing and baraka if you avoid interest. Uh, and it is possible. Uh, and, and we have seen a model and we have implemented a model where it's working, alhamdulillah. It is rightly said that the more we strive, even if you take a single step, Allah will take 10 steps with you. So this is the live example of how we can exemplify the resources we have at hand if channelized in the right direction. To sum it all up, it all comes down to the three basic assets, which is aqidah, application, if educated in the right manner. So Mr. Abdullah Khan, it's been an absolute honor to share the screen with you to share your views and opinions on what Islamic education holds for our children. And with the reins in your hand, we are rest assured that our kids are in excellent prospects. Alhamdulillah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and your family with excellent health and halal wealth and to cause all that you've done to be satwa for you and your entire family. I mean, jazakallah khair and kaseer and kaseer for your time and effort. And with this, we come to the end of an insightful interview. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamu ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaq biruka. Wa atubu ilayka. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.